I've come to a Cheltenham hotel to meet the man behind one of the best kept secrets in British intelligence. The man who picked up where cryptographer James Ellis left off. This is the first time an employee of GCHQ at the heart of the Secret Service has ever been allowed to talk about his work on television. Clifford Cox's story begins just after his arrival at GCHQ when his boss let him in on the first of a lifetime of secrets. One afternoon he said that there was this really you know, interesting idea which I ought to know about and he explained uh, James's ideas to me. Um, not, not with the intention they said I should work on them but simply that I ought to know about them because they were interesting. James called it non-secret encryption and put like that it sounded actually quite impossible. So I then went home that evening, went back to the, the digs and then after dinner, um, I sort of sat down and started to think about the, the problem. Unlike those before him who had failed or even thought a solution impossible, Clifford Cox had studied an arcane branch of pure mathematics called number theory. And it was this unusually intimate understanding of the numeric world that enabled Cox to take a totally fresh approach to solving the problem. How long did this take? How, how long actually, the, the, the whole process was actually quite short. It, it was really no more than sort of half an hour or, or, or thereabouts. And of course, you know, as I'd done this out of work, I mean, it was all in my head at that stage. I couldn't actually write anything down. Why not? Oh, because... Um, this work was being done in a classified environment, so I'm allowed to think about things out of work, but not allowed to uh, put anything down on paper. And you did the whole thing in your head? Th that's right. It was all done, yes, in my head, with that evening after dinner. And this is it, the most revolutionary breakthrough in cryptography. C equals M to the power E mod N a mathematical padlock and a key. In just half an hour of thinking, Clifford Cox had found that rare beast, a one-way operation that can be reversed, but only with a secret key. I asked him to explain how it works. N there is that composite number, the product of the two primes. First of all, N I only need to invert it modulo P and modulo Q separately. X to the power N to you and you want to recover X. There's something called the challenge remainder theorem that says if I've done that, I can P then, and, and x to the power n modulo q. I could the maths that. is pretty complicated, Generating but here's a beginner's guide to how it works. First, I pick two secret numbers, say 11 and 17. These will be my secret key. I then multiply them together to get 187. And I put the 187 into the equation instead of the n to make a mathematical padlock that is exclusive to me. But I make sure to keep the 11 and 17 absolutely secret. They are my key and I'll need them later. At this point, I make all the other details of my padlock public so that anyone can use it to encrypt messages to me. So let's imagine that somebody wants to send me a message, um, let's say a secret kiss. As computers convert all letters into numbers, so the letter X becomes the number 88. The sender puts this 88 into the equation where this M is. M for message. Now they can calculate a value for this letter C and that turns out to be 165. So what's happening is that the sender is taking the message 88 and encrypting it as the number 165 and it's this number 165 that they send to me. If the number 165 is intercepted on its way, then the message, that kiss, is still perfectly safe. 
because it was encrypted with Cox's equation. That's a one-way operation. Nobody can reverse it. But hang on. I need to be able to reverse it if I'm going to read the message. Remember those first two numbers I picked? The ones I multiplied together to get 187? That key I've been keeping secret from everyone. It turns out that Cox had designed another version of his equation, which if I, and only I, know those secret numbers, can unlock the mathematical padlock. So I put the encrypted message, 165, as well as my two secret numbers, 11 and 17, into this new equation. Knowing 11 and 17 is the only way to get back to the original message, 88, that secret kiss. I was you know, quite keen to, you know, to get into work the next morning and explain you know, what, I'd, what I'd achieved. Um, and also to be able to sort of you know, put it down on paper and think a little bit more about the making sure it really was secure. Because there was this remaining step, which was, is it really going to be that hard to undo all this? Cox had a point. If I've published my padlock for everyone to see, then surely somebody could take my number, 187, and work backwards to get my two original secret numbers. But remember, multiplying is a one-way operation. It's very difficult to go backwards. Exactly how difficult depends on the size of the numbers. With 11 and 17, my two secret numbers, it wouldn't actually take very long to work them out. But what if I choose two numbers that are much bigger, each, say, 300 digits long? Then my personalised padlock is really secure. And that is simply because factoring the product of such huge numbers is fantastically time-consuming. In fact, all the computers in the world today would take longer than the age of the universe to crack my code. By which time, who cares about my secret? The maths is tough, but the crucial thing is that Cox had invented a super secure encryption system. And even more importantly, he'd solved the key distribution problem. This padlock is the most important breakthrough in the history of secret codes. Aware of the huge potential of Ellis and Cox's solution to the key distribution problem, it was classified, like all government cryptographic work, and it remained a closely guarded secret. Meanwhile, back in America, Whitfield Diffie and Martin Hellman were still no further forward. They published their big idea in the autumn of 1976, hoping that somebody else could make it work. Eventually, in 1977, Ronald Rivest, R.D. Shamir and Leonard Adelman, researchers at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, discovered a very similar mathematical equation to that of Clifford Cox, but four years after him. As with Cox, their rare knowledge of number theory had won the day. But this time, the discovery was in the public arena, where its potential could be realised. Knowing nothing about the British discovery, they named the cipher Rivest Shamir Adelman, RSA. That summer, they began to publicise the invention. I happened to be in a bookstore, and the person working there and another individual were talking about, did you see this amazing stuff in Scientific American? And I said, my goodness, you know, that's, that's our code. And the guy um, turned and asked me for my autograph. Now, you know, mathematicians are always asked, asked for their autograph, but this one's <laughs> special. No, it, you know, it never happens. And I thought, gee, maybe, maybe there's more to this crypto stuff than I had understood. 
RSA went on to become one of the most important ciphers ever. Almost every time someone's credit card or bank details are transmitted over the internet, they are encrypted with RSA, making it the foundation for today's multi-billion dollar e-commerce revolution. The company, RSA Security, is now worth around two and a half billion dollars. You know that little lock on the bottom of your browser that sometimes opens and sometimes closes? Uh, that's typically RSA security. In fact, I've heard the number of copies of it is uh, over 500 million copies. And it's even been suggested that there's no other program uh, that has more copies installed than the RSA code. Um, more than Windows, more than Netscape, more than Explorer. While the Americans gathered fame and fortune, GCHQ maintained their silence for over two decades. In December 1997, they finally went public, nearly 25 years after Ellis and Cox had made their original discovery. Despite remarkably parallel experiences as scientists, the Secret Service cryptographer and the independent visionary still live worlds apart. I, I don't think I was, I was certainly not looking for publicity. I mean, you know, you know, um, I mean, do not go to work at a place like CSG f for that reason. I admired those guys. They were very smart people. They made uh, very lovely uh, discoveries. And uh, yet, at the same time, they had sacrificed you know, personal aggrandizement for what they perceived was the good of their country. The Americans were not the first to invent what is now called public key cryptography. But they were the first to bring it out into the open, where everyone can use it. At last, ordinary folk like you and me can communicate as privately as any secret agent. In fact, we can now send messages that can't be cracked, even by the combined efforts of all the world's secret services. For the first time ever, we all have access to unbreakable codes. Cryptography, the science of secrecy, is no longer a secret science. <laughs>